So let's go to the Lord and thank Him for this opportunity to be here today. Lord God, thank You. Thank You for the presence of Your Holy Spirit that has drawn us here, Lord. We're not here on our own. You have drawn us. You've drawn us to worship You, to speak to us from Your Word. Lord, so I pray that Your Holy Spirit would engage our minds and hearts as we read the confession, as we read the Scripture, as we hear the Scripture proclaimed, Lord, as even we're going to talk about today, how your spirit uses that uh, for your glory. So, Lord, I pray that you'd be honored and glorified during this time. And thank you for the opportunity to be online. We pray for those that um, may be watching, maybe have to watch that way today. Um, and we pray that those connections would stay uh, strong. And we just thank you and praise you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you all hear me back there okay? All right. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 9, verses 1 through 10. Aaron is going to lead us in it, so let's stand and, and be called to worship by God. Psalm 9, please join me. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all the marvelous things you have done. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, O Most High. My enemies retreated, and they staggered and died when you appeared. For you have judged in my favor. From your throne you have judged with fairness. You have rebuked the nations and destroyed the wicked. You have embraced their needs forever. The enemy is finished in endless ruins. The city and luxury are now forgotten. But the Lord reigns forever, executing judgment from his son. He will judge the world with justice and rule the nations with fairness. The Lord is a shelter for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you. For you, O Lord, do not abandon those who search for you. 
Please greet one another in the name of the Lord as we get ready to sing the name of the Lord. Howdy, man. 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 Hey there, howdy, there, howdy. There. Hey, everybody. Thanks for lighting the candles. Greetings. Greetings.
Be seated, invite the kids to come forward.
Okay, now you know a verse there that you can share with someone, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1. I don't know how God, I don't know how the Holy Spirit does it, but he uses his word to reach the hearts of people. So can you keep that verse in your minds? Can you guys keep that in your minds? Yes. All right. Let's see if we can remember that big one again. Some of it. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. First Timothy 1, 7. All right. Let me ask you this. Who made you? God. What else did God make? Animals and everything. And fireworks. And fireworks? Well, you know what? Absolutely. Did you see the fireflies in the They were everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I saw some fireflies at the tonight. You saw them and you caught one. Yeah, I, I, I have some. You know my bird jar, Pastor Justin? Oh, you know the bird jar? Yes. yes. All right. Now, now, what do you think? The other day, there was a storm that went through, and then I Who's that a promise from? God. It's a promise from God. Share in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, and then you can. Now, why did He make you and everything else? Because God made us. For what reason? For His own. For His own glory. All right, for His let's, own glory too. For His own glory. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for these kids, and Lord, I pray that you would. Instill your word inside of them so that they share it with others and you use it for people to know you. Lord, let them uh, continue to love you and praise you as they grow into God fearing men and women. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. I think there's some treats left in there. Well, if you were here last week, you will remember that I read the three chapters of the small book of Titus from the New Testament, and that reading of that scripture was the sermon for the week. So today we're going to look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We're not going to be done with them because we're actually going to come back to those same verses next week and talk about some other things. Um, but we're going to talk about select parts of 1, 1 through 4 this morning. So before we do that, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Here we are to worship, not on our own, but you've drawn us here to contemplate and to think about the cost of you giving your life on that cross gives us way over 10,000 reasons to say, bless the Lord. Thank you for these kids. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. To get you to come. You are here. And Lord, you want to speak to your people from your word. And I don't understand how you do that. But the promise is that you do that. So I pray that you will speak to your people through your word this morning. I do pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, will be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Lord, you are my rock. You are my redeemer. Speak to your people this morning for your glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. <laughs> Titus 1, 1-4. Hear the word of the Lord. Paul. 
a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God... with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A few weeks ago, you may remember that I started out the sermon showing you an old Burger King. some other slogans and I, and I and because you're worth it is any women that might be familiar with L'Oreal I took an advertising class in college and what I learned in that advertising class is that the purpose of advertising is to try and make you feel like you have a need that the product you're trying to sell can fulfill. And I looked at some advertising, and a lot of it has to do with happiness. Open happiness. Oh, pure happiness. Hershey's, the happiest place on earth. Disney. Happy tastes good. Dairy. You see, in the, the world, in the culture, the secular, meaning without God, in that world, people are smart enough to know that all of us human beings have this void inside of us. And the advertisers say, I know what will fill that void. But they also know that what they're selling won't ever completely satisfy the void. That's why they have to keep advertising. I once thought to myself, why do we need to continue advertising Coca-Cola? Everybody knows about Coca-Cola. You have to continually try and keep people to purchase that product because they will never be satisfied. You have to keep advertising Coke. You have to keep advertising Disney. And deep down, way below, at the spiritual level behind this, is the enemy of God, Satan. And Satan's saying, keep those fools focused on themselves. Keep those fools thinking, what do I need? What is about me? What will satisfy my mind and my heart and my body and my behavior? And when you start thinking of this completely me-centered culture, you get the island of Crete, where Paul was writing to Titus. You also get, I believe, the prevailing culture of our time and our place in 2024. Now, not every single person, and not the United States as a nation, but our pervading culture that we live in, the air we breathe, the culture around us says, no, there's no God other than you. You are God, so please yourself find happiness. And into that type of culture, Titus is charged by the Apostle Paul, help start some churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches of the Lord Jesus Christ that are not focused on me, but are focused on Christ. And then that is lived out by serving one another. He's telling Titus, it's going to look different when you are a follower of Christ. And this small letter of Titus is spelling that out for Titus and for us. And in the opening verses, what I just read to you, verses 1 through 4, in the original Greek is one long rambling sentence. And it starts with being a servant. And it talks about being a servant of the God who is truth. 
And it talks about how when you proclaim that God of truth, He works for His glory. So the message I hope you will hear this morning is that God is true. And He uses His servants to bring faith to others with the proclamation of His word. All for His glory. We're going to look a little bit about the background of Crete. We're going to talk about the God of truth, our role as servants, how God works, and then ask the question, so what? First, the background. Since the resurrection of Jesus, roughly 33 AD, the message of Jesus has been circulating out. It's been spreading. You remember what happened in the day of Pentecost. They all heard the works of God. They heard about Jesus. And God is using Paul to spread that message. Now, we're not told in the scripture when Paul was on the island of Crete. But we know that he must have been because in verse 5, as we'll see later on, he says, this is why I left you, Titus. He left him on Crete in order to continue the work. Now, we do know that on that day of Pentecost, one of the groups that were represented, specifically mentioned, is Cretans, those who live on the island of Crete. There were Cretans there on that day of Pentecost, and perhaps some of them became believers in Christ, went home, and started to share on the island. We do know that Paul was near the island. There's in Acts, I believe it's chapter 27, there's a whole thing about him sailing around Crete. So we're never told about him being on Crete, but we know he was, and we know others have come to know the Lord Jesus, and some way, somehow, the message of Christ has gotten to that island, and small churches and houses are popping up throughout the island. Now, Crete is an island approximately 150 miles long. Its smallest width is seven miles, that's not very big, and its largest width is 150 miles. No, I'm sorry, 35. 150 long, seven to 35 wide. And it's approximately 60 miles southeast of Greece. It's a beautiful place. When our Bible study, I posted um, some pictures on our handout of, from TripAdvisor on some beautiful trips that you can go on today on the island of Crete. But the highlight of their culture was from 2200 to 1500 BC. That's when King Minos, or Minos, M-I-N-O-S, when he ruled in the palace at Knossos. And supposedly, there's a lot of mythological qualities to him. Supposedly, in the palace was a labyrinth where a minotaur was kept. You know, half man, half bull, and eight human beings. Crete claimed to be the birthplace of Zeus. There were some that also claimed to be the burial place of Zeus, which would come into play with them being liars. But there's lots of mythological qualities to the history of the culture of the island of Crete. But by the time of Jesus, it had been taken over mostly by pirates, mercenaries, and what we might call the riffraff of society. I showed in Bible study, I likened it to the bar scene in the original Star Wars movie, where they come in and just see all of this crazy uh, creatures and everything like that. It wasn't known as the best of places. One of the most famous Cretans, who was considered one of the seven wise people of ancient culture, Epimenides, he was quoted as saying, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And Paul actually quotes him in chapter 1, verse 13, and says, this testimony is true. So I believe there's a lot of similarities between the island of Crete, as Paul is writing to Titus, and the culture that surrounds us. It was very much a me-first culture. I and mean, anything goes that I want culture. And one of the first things inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul says to Titus, is remind them and remind us that in a world of lies, 
We are dealing with the God of truth. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began. I don't mean to tell you that we are surrounded by lies. The politicians lie. The car places lie. I made the mistake of going to one of those quick oil change places one time, and they showed me my cabin filter and how dirty it was. Well, I knew enough not to buy it from them because it'd be out 13 bucks. I'll go to Walmart and get it, so I'm only out three bucks. When I went to install that cabin filter, I found out my car didn't even take that cabin filter. They, remember, they had showed me my dirty cabin filter. Now, they had showed me a dirty cabin filter. And thankfully, I was only out three bucks. People lie. We are used to being surrounded by lies. And lies come from the enemy. Jesus said in John 8, 44, Satan was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar and the father of lies. In the Greek language, the word pseudo means false. Satan is pseudo. In this passage in the Greek, we're told that God is a pseudo, not false. God never lies. This passage here in Titus tells us, and so do a number of other passages. Numbers 23, 19. God is not man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not fulfill it? 1 Samuel 15, 29. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or have regrets. For he's not a man, and he should have regret. Hebrews 6, 17. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So the revealed word of God places starkly in front of us, God does not lie. And the question on the table for each one of us then is, will we trust that? Will we trust the one that we are told created heavens and earth? Will we trust that he is indeed good all the time, and all the time he is good? Because sometimes, well, I'm too sure. And sometimes if we trust that he's telling the truth, we realize we're in for some scary times. Do you realize Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble? Next week one of the things we'll look at is having a godly life. Paul told Timothy in another passage, if you want to live a godly life, you will be persecuted. God is good all the time? Do I trust that he never lies? I submit to you to trust that he never lies. To stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. We're not called to understand it. We're called to trust it. God never lies. Next thing I want to look at from this passage is our role as servants. And I am just blown away by how the Holy Spirit set us up in Sunday school. I didn't talk to Josh. I didn't know he was going to talk about the, the serpent mounds and, and this identity thing. And he's already set the table for this. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. The English word servant is the Greek word doulos. And doulos involves 
ownership. Now, wait a minute, Pastor Jefferson. We live in a culture where we do what we want. Remember, have it your way. Make yourself happy. I'm not subject to anybody. Paul says, I am completely, utterly owned by another. I am completely, utterly owned by Jesus Christ. The better translation in English of doulos is not servant. It is slave. And a slave is one that did, does the desires of his or her master. And this isn't an uncommon description of God's people. In Revelation, it refers back to the Old Testament in Moses and calls him a slave of God. Joshua, it says, was a slave of Yahweh. So think about this. Paul is writing the Titus, and he could have said, Paul, a Pharisee of Pharisees. Paul, one of the biggest authors of the New Testament. Paul, pretty darn good tent maker. But instead, he says, Paul, one that has been bought and paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. See, Paul knew Peter, and he knew what Peter would write in 1 18 and 19, 1 Peter 1 18 and 19. Peter says, You were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of the Lamb without blemish or spot. Paul starts out his letter to Titus by saying, Paul, one who has been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ, and now is a slave, not looking to do my will, but saying, what can I do that will please him? This is completely counter to our culture in the advertising world that says you need to have it your way and do what pleases you. Paul saying, I am subject to the one who bought me and I want to please him. Paul identifies as a slave of God. And that's our identity as a Christian. A slave of God. Bought and paid for. Our thinking should be that. What can I do to please my master? What can I do to be like him who said, I didn't come to serve, or to be served, but to serve and give my life. When I was a camp counselor many years ago in college, we had a, a saying, the context of leadership is servanthood. We are servants of God, seeking to please Him. So the question for me and the question for you is, are you focused on pleasing Him? Are you saved by Jesus and connected to Him and saying, how can I please you today, Lord? And stating with Paul, I am a servant of God. Third thing I want to look at is, is how God works. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth with the, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. Now again, we're going to come back next week and look at some of the places that we're neglecting this week one of them is that Paul is a servant and he's an apostle for the sake of bringing God's elect to faith. But today we're going to look at how he does that. By preaching. At the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching with which I have been entrusted by the command of God our Savior. What he's getting at here is a concept that I believe the modern church has completely disregarded. And it's this concept. God uses the proclamation of his word to bring people to faith. Pastor Jefferson, I don't understand that. Neither do I. I don't understand that, but the Holy Spirit 
uses the speaking and proclaiming of God's word to bring dead spiritual hearts to life. And I'm afraid that in many places, the modern church, just like our culture, has placed the emphasis on us. Do these five steps and someone will come to Christ. Say the sinner's prayer and they will come to Christ. I was talking with a friend recently, and he was talking about how he had been sharing Christ with someone, and he said, yeah, but I never got him to say the sinner's prayer. And I said, that's all right, no one in Scripture ever said it either. <laughs> we try to make everything a formula. God says, be my servant, proclaim my word, and I'll do the work. The Greek word translated manifest means disclosed, made clear. The Greek word preaching is Kerygma, I think that's how you pronounce it. Kerygma, I've heard it kerygma, but I think it's kerygma. John MacArthur says this is the message that a herald would give on behalf of a ruler or a town council under whom he served. An official proclamation. You can translate it correctly as proclamation or preaching. This is an amazing point. I hope that you will hear and internalize God uses the proclamation of his word to disclose or make clear eternal life. He uses the proclaiming of his word to bring people into relationship with himself through faith, repentance, and trust. Now, you may be thinking, you're making that up, Pastor Jefferson. I'm not making it up. He's always done that. Matthew 12, 41. This is Jesus speaking. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. What caused them to repent in Nineveh? The kerugma, the proclamation of God's word by Jonah. 1 Corinthians 1.21 for since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. It pleased God to save those who believe. How? Through the folly of the kerugma, of what was proclaimed, of what was preached. The proclamation of Jesus is what God uses to bring spiritual hearts to light. That's why Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. Pastor Tim Chester explains it pretty clearly, I think. He says this, God is a saving God. He gives us the privilege of telling others. He gives us the command to tell others. As we do that, eternity enters history and Jesus Christ becomes clear. First, God chooses people to be saved through the proclamation of the gospel. Second, he commands people to proclaim the gospel to them. Paul says the hope of eternal life has been brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. I think you can see the concept most clearly in Romans 10, 14 to 17. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So Paul is telling Titus and us, here is what will bring people to Jesus on the island of Crete. A great building. No. An awesome praise band. No. Air conditioning. No. A youth program, a choir, giving away Steeler tickets. No, no, no. What will bring people to Jesus Christ on the self-centered, me first, nasty island of Christ? What will bring people to Jesus Christ in our land of sex, drugs, and rock and roll is the proclamation of Jesus. 
the proclamation of God's word. I don't understand it. But somehow or some way, according to his word, the Holy Spirit uses that to bring people to repentance and faith. I also love that. Well, a number of questions today. Number one, who are you going to listen to? The advertisers? Who purposely try to create in you a need that only their product will fulfill? The lies around us in our culture? Or the truth of the God who never lies? The God who has revealed to us who he is, the creator, the one who is holy, holy, holy. The one that revealed to us what we learned in Bible school. No one does good, not even one. The one who told us, I love you so much, I'm going to enter time and space and lead the perfect life and die on a cross to sacrifice for your sins that those goats and bulls and everything were pointing forward to in order to make us servants. So what? Who are you going to listen to? Second question. How will you be identified by your bank account? Title before your name? In our culture, the, the big thing is your, your skin color or your gender. That's not our identification. Our identification is who we belong to. I'm a person made in God's image, bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, I'm subject to him. I'm his servant. And finally, will you be used by him to bring others to faith? Will you be by proclaiming his word? Pastor Jefferson, you're the preacher, not me. Yes, I have the title of preacher. But God has set it up so that I and you can proclaim his word. You can memorize John 3, 16. Well, what's that going to be, Pastor Jefferson? I don't know. I don't understand. But God tells us if you memorize that and share it with someone, he will use it. Well, I'm not a good memorizer, Pastor Jefferson, so read it. Get together with someone and say, hey, have you ever looked at Romans 3, 21 to 26? Would you read it with me? Well, how is he going to use that? I don't understand it. But the Holy Spirit tells us as we get people reading his word and proclaiming his word, he will do the work. I, I have a guess, and this is just my guess, that one of the reasons why the church, and I don't mean specifically our church, I mean the, the church in general in our nation. One of the reasons I believe the church is so weak is because we've gotten away from God's plan. We've gotten away from this idea that we proclaim and He works. Because in order to proclaim, we have to know what's in that book. So the so what is get in that book. Ask him to help you. If he says this is how I'm going to work, he will help you learn it. Say, so, Lord, help your Holy Spirit to teach me this word and to share it with others. I'm your servant. God is true. And he uses his servants to bring faith to others <clears throat> with the proclamation of his word for his glory. So may we listen to the one who is true. May we obey and identify as his servant. And may we learn and then proclaim his word. So that to his glory, he can go to work. God is true. And he uses his servants to bring faith to others with the proclamation of his word for his glory. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your word. And I pray that I have correctly spoken it, proclaimed it this morning. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will use it in a mighty way. 
It doesn't make sense to us, Lord. We like a checklist of things to do. Yeah. You simply say, proclaim the word, and I'll go to work. And you are the God that never lies, so we can't question that. So, Lord, we, I pray that you would change our hearts, change our minds, be transformed by the renewing of, of our minds into how you do things. Or maybe there's someone here that says, you know, I've been identifying by my job or by something material in life. And I see what Christ has done for me and, and forgiven my sins. And, and, and I, I want to be a servant. So Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that has known about you, but they haven't actually known you in relationship, today would be the day where they say, Father, forgive my sins and faith I trust what you do in the cross. And I know I'm your son, I'm your daughter. And I want to serve you, empowered by your Holy Spirit. Lord, I know there are those here that for many years and, and decades have been your servants. Deepen those roots today. Give them an opportunity to be used by you for your glory by sharing your word. Help someone to, to say, I can learn your word. I can memorize your word. I can at least share your word. And give us those opportunities for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. We respond to God's word in a number of different ways. One of them is to go to him in prayer. We had a number of requests in Sunday school um, for folks that are dealing with uh, cancer. We heard some praises of some friends that, that are cancer free. We praise God for that. But there is a number of people that we can continue to be praying for. If you'd like to know specifically, ask me afterwards. Um, if you weren't in Sunday school, but continue to, to pray for those that are dealing with sicknesses, hospital stays, the battle with cancer, and many other things that are on our hearts. I will leave a time during the prayer if you'd like to praise him or, or bring something before the Lord out loud that you can do that. Let's go to him and pray. Thank you, Lord, that you never lie. And in your truth, you tell us as your sons and daughters that we are welcome in your presence, that we can cast our cares upon you. We give you praise. We heard two reports of people saying that they were cancer-free. Oh, Lord, we praise you. Lord, we heard reports of those that are in different stages of the battle with cancer. I lift them up to you and ask for your healing and mercy. We heard about friends that are in the hospital. We heard about loved ones that are transitioning, moving from one place to another. Lord, we praise you for someone that was found. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. And would you hear anything that your people would like to, to bring to you out loud right now? Thank you that you hear the things that we keep inside of us. Lord, I thank you for what happened in the walls of this building two weeks ago now. It's hard to believe it's been that long ago, the Vacation Bible School. And I pray that your spirit will continue to marinate your word into the hearts of those kids. And Lord, I thank you that it wasn't this past week when it was so dreadfully hot. Thank you that you had all of that done, and we praise you and give you glory. Lord, we pray for those that are, are struggling in different ways. Maybe it's, maybe it's with some sort of a relationship or something is going on in their life, Lord, where they're just distracted from you. Would you bring them peace and mercy in your hands? Lord, would you be with those that Proclaim your word as missionaries here in the United States and around the world. Would you be with those that, that serve us? I'm thinking of the volunteer firemen and women and policemen and women. 
Lord, we thank you and praise you that you love us, that you promise to be with us, that you will use us to share your message with other people. Thank you, Lord. We love you and praise you. And we ask you to hear us now as we come together with one voice, praying prayer in your tongue. Our Father, who art in heaven, how will be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory of the we respond to God's word by giving of our time, our abilities, and the resources he's given us in the first place. So I invite the ushers to come forward and receive the tithes and offerings given here. Jesus may go out throughout western Pennsylvania and throughout your world and that you will provide for every need of your people. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated and invite you to look at your hand over happenings. Bible study is at 5 o'clock on Tuesday. Um, many baby bottles have been brought back, but if you still have one out there, if you can try and get it back by next week, that way we can get them the choices, and, and that um, can help them out. We're going to Lakeview next week, next um, Sunday at 3 o'clock, if you've never been there, and we'd like to go. It's, it's an awesome experience to be with the people there, so I just encourage you to think about it and pray about maybe joining us on, on that day. I believe that July 31st is going to be our picnic that we have every summer at the Harsh Barber Mobile Home Park. It is the 31st, Lord willing, no storms or anything. So mark that on your calendar. We'll be giving you more information as we get closer on how we can help with that. And I believe it's this Thursday that is the tour of choices. Is that correct? And um, can they still sign up? Yes. You can still sign up. And as Beth mentioned last week, that's not just for... Um, older women, bring the, the teens, bring the kids, let them see what they do there. Um, you'll be impressed when you go there with um, all that they, that ministry does. It's a lot more than many people probably understand. Or think. Finally, um, I have a note here that I would like to read to you. It says, it's from the, the Little Veal family. It says, Dear Hanover Church family, thank you for being part of Mom's life. She enjoyed the many visits she received and your thoughts and prayers during recent days. Thank you for the delicious food. We will miss her dearly, but know she's in God's loving care. We'll be all Thank you all that, that helped out in any way. Any other announcements? Uh, tomorrow starts the vouchers, the farmer vouchers. Um, you're eligible if you live in Beaver County and are 60 or over by December 31st, 2024. You need to bring your photo ID with you. The first one tomorrow is 10 to 2 at Lincoln Park Performing Arts at the Alumni Building. There's one this week, Tuesday, 
uh, 10 to 1 at the Sound Alarm Ministry in Aliquippa, and Friday at the Center of Friends in New Brighton from 10 to 1. They're all through this month, July, and August. You have till November to use the vouchers. You will receive five $10 vouchers, which you can use at the local farmers markets for any produce or fruits that they grow in their market. It's a nice incentive from our state of Pennsylvania. We pay enough taxes and take advantage of it if you can. Thank you for connecting everybody to that. Final announcement I want to make, I forgot to bring it up front, but in the back there's some half sheet flyers. Um, later on this summer, there is going to be um, the Child Evangelism Fellowship, what's called a five-day club. We've done that before here. We've also done it at the trailer park. Um, it's a sort of mini vacation Bible school. It's a little bit shorter, um, but they have a lesson. There's a time for games and snacks, and it's all done by the teenagers who are spending the summer doing this through uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship. The flyers are in the back. It will be the last week of July. I believe it starts on Monday, July 29th. And it will be actually at the Historical Village. Um, and the, I don't remember the time, but it's on there on the flyer. And so um, pass the word out for uh, young kids, elementary age kids, um, to come and, and hear more about God's Word. All right. Our closing song, we sang a newer version of this from Vacation Bible School last week. Um, it's a great old hymn that we call on our God, our help, in ages past. So stand and sing. so that his Holy Spirit may reach out and bring life and faith to others through us. Now receive the message. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace.